in various other modules. And it's, 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 it's a humbling experience to, 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 to get that, you know, to our students say, say, we, have, we actually came across one of your videos and we said we have to register. Okay. Um, so last week we we did we had what we, what I can call ethical learning. Last week one was just ethical learning where we didn't cover much because we realized that some of you our students were yet to to join. We were actually having exams and and we said let us give you some breathing space, some exam break. But now now that you are in and you are done. It would make a lot of sense if you get if you get the ball rolling right away. Uh, <clears throat> lots of courses there, so you shall notice um, most of you you were enrolled last week on the on the learning platform. You you were enrolled on this particular you were enrolled on this particular courses on these particular courses which were coded 2021 slash 2022 2021 slash 2022 our admin team will migrate you from these courses to the new ones we have added new ones today 2022 slash 2023 so i expect everyone by end of day tomorrow to let me know that you have checked on your quarter and the code the, the 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 period called is now saying 2022 to 2023. The reason why we have done that is because the syllabus has changed, but there are minor changes. But get it from your say. Don't continue with these. We are going to remove these beds during the course of next week. So we are now here. Everyone should be doing this. So this is going to be no wonder why it's saying there's zero person enrolled here because we are still we have just added this course today in the last few hours because we have reviewed the syllabus. So from tomorrow, everyone should be enrolled on strategic business reporting 2022 slash 2023. So all these are the ones we have registered today. These ones who are now on these courses. But as for you, you can see majority of you guys, you are still on these courses. 34 students year, eight students year, 102 students year, 51 students year. So tomorrow morning you are going to be migrated from these courses through to these the correctly coded courses on the platform. You let me know by end, end of day tomorrow if you are yet to be migrated because this this now incorporates the syllabus change. Now, uh, so the subject of interest is strategic business reporting. So I'm clicking there. Uh, I'm opening as a student so that you I will take you to the interface that you'll be using. <clears throat> So once you are enrolled on the platform, this will be your landing page. If you click on the subject strategic business reporting, it will take you to this page. Notice this is the new syllabus. This has been already confirmed with ACCA. So what it means here is when we are on this, there's no need for you to say, am I doing the current stuff? We have already done the quality check, quality control checks, and they are all complete so you 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 are ready to go so you'll be taken to the introductory section i say i discussed this last week so i'm not going to spend much time discussing this all you have to do is to come to the introductory section of the platform and they are populated the instructions as to how you study sbr on the platform of particular interest is this particular video you you hit the view button on the video as soon as you, have, you hit the view button, you know, the video will start playing. So this is a 17 minute video taking you through how we you have to cover SBR on the platform. If you realize that the video is not playing, 
you can see on the bottom status of progress bar here, at the bottom right, that there are three dots. Hit these three dots, you see the download button there. So you can click download and get the video downloaded. Right, so already, as for me, the video is being downloaded, so let me cancel the download. Right. Okay. Then another thing, still on the introductory uh, section is the study plan. This is a holistic document, a holistic and downloadable document, which details how we are going to study SBR on the platform. And, and it, it's, it's a very handy document, meaning be with this document each time you are studying on the platform. You can see, uh, that's the document you need. That's the study plan. Now, it's saying you need a minimum of 46 hours to complete the syllabus. Just 46 hours. So, we have timed this. So, even if you just say one hour per day, so you need one and a half months from today to complete it. So, each section of the syllabus, we have slotted time you should spend and the practical experience relevance for each subject is given. Now, you do notice that this time you should spend reading the notes as well as attempting these questions. We have already selected questions for you, which we feel have got enormous examinative import. So after you, you click C1, it's 115 minutes, make sure you do these questions so that you really understand what revenue is all about. And current assets in, in the like manner, allocated times as well as selected questions. So this is so, so important. Now you may ask a good question and say, say, where will I be getting these questions? These questions are under the study material section of the, on the platform. You know, within the study material section on the platform, you notice that we are no longer going to be writing notes. No, we are. We are not. We are not going to be writing notes during the course of our study. But rather, we are going to. We we have already populated the course notes for you. So these are the course notes and course notes. They bank and there is a study text question bank is me is another way of saying revision kit and then there is a study text study text we need it for detailed background study so there's course notes question bank and study text but course notes and question bank alone may is uh, normally they suffice in the course of this particular discussion right so Last week, Melvin, I said you should do what and what on the platform. Uh, I said we should do A, B, and C one. A, B, and C one, and I said these are these concepts are basically theory heavy, and you can understand them right away on the go. A, B, and C one. So, if you've done that, what I'm sure you were also in the lecture. Yeah, are you done with A? B and C1. You can show, you can let me know by even clicking raise the end or react with a thumbs up sign, or you can unmute and talk to me. What I'm asking, are you now done with A, B, and C1? I did only A and B, C1, I didn't do that one yet. Okay, so I had to, to cover C1. So those who have joined us yeah. today, okay, perfect. Uh, you need to make sure you wrap it down. So those who have joined us today, this is basically what we asked your colleagues to do last week. Uh, you write an exam, so we couldn't bother you much. And we carefully selected those A aspects because they are the aspects which you can understand on the call, meaning they are not that difficult. You can simply understand them on the go. 
Um, let me see if I can find a video in which I explained this. Because of time, I may allow you to leapfrog. You know, to leapfrog is to, I may just allow you to jump through that by playing that particular video. Right. Because of time, because I want you to catch up with your colleagues right away, right away. Let me see. Let me see if I have that. OK. So you have it. Check in your WhatsApp class group, those who have joined us today. You notice that uh, it's, it's like fundamental, it's a fundamental ethical and professional principles, uh, ISB conceptual framework, and revenue from contracts with customers. This is what I have sent in the WhatsApp class group. This is basically what I asked your colleagues to do last week. So because of time, I want you to quickly catch up with your colleagues. How you can do that is you can play that video and then go on the platform at, at, at appropriate times. So what is it that we want to cover today? What we want to cover today, as you can see, I have sent that information in our WhatsApp class group. We want to cover groups. We want to cover groups, which is this pre-linked material for our Skype session. Right, and groups are, are what are actually on which topics on the platform. Uh, groups are on section D on the platform. So you may say, say, why starting with groups? Why jumping to D? Why? It's because these are the things which really matter. Number one, groups appear on number, or they constitute the first question in every ACCA exam. So because groups constitute uh, the first question, if we do groups last, we create a situation where you panic. We create a situation where you panic. By that I mean, I mean, we create a situation where you may be you coming across question papers, but you won't be even able to answer question one until the last. So your confidence will be dampened in the interim. So if we do groups, say second week of July, I mean, or, or say last week of July, because it's on the last topics. It means we'll get to the last week of July without you even being able to answer question one. So from experience, I realized that students end up panicking. So in mitigation, we start with groups so that on, on any paper, you are able to do question one. That's the logic, and we have to agree on that. We have to agree on that. So what, what the heck is happening on my on my machine here? You know? Well, I don't know what is this. Okay. All right. So allow me to open my Excel document where I will be explaining some of these concepts. So you can open that handout on groups. Make sure it's open and we have it ready with you. Make sure it's open and we have it ready with you. All right. So you can see here, these are the groups. So we, we want to discuss D1. Uh, we want to discuss D1. And. D3 today. This week, OK, I think I'm typing in the chat this week. We want to cover groups. Cover groups. Oops, that is that is D1 and D3. D3. 
D3. So next week we shall then D, do D4 and so forth. So today we want to cover D1 and D3. Why not doing D2, which is the statement of cash flows? This D2 cannot be undertaken because it requires us to first complete all the standards. And the standards are under section C. So C1 through to C what? C1 through to C11, they are all accounting standards. So D1 and D3, that's what we want to cover this week. So D2, we'll cover it as a last topic, which is on statements of cash flows. The reason why we cover it on the last topic is because statements of cash flows, they presuppose that we are done with the syllabus. All right. Remember, one thing that I mentioned in last week, I said, don't try to open the mocks yet, the mock exams, because the mock exams are timed. So if you open the mock, chances are you activate the marking scheme. And by the time you then really want to do the mock, you, have, you face problems. <clears throat> Right. OK, let me open. I want to open that end out here. OK, so there you are. So today we have to relax and make sure you're paying attention to quite a lot of aspects that I'm going to discuss with you today. Right? It's opening. Okay, allow it to open. Okay, so you you might appreciate that the 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 topic on groups is basically what you have covered in your earlier modules. If if you were not exempted FRA, you would notice you have done groups. And the the very same concepts you covered then, they form the basis of the initial discussions that we are going to have on groups, and then we just escalate it a little bit to make it stra uh, compatible with strategic level. Right. So, group financial statements are normally are regulated by business combinations, which is IFRS 3 and IFRS 10, which is consolidated financial statements. So there is IFRS 3, which talks about business combinations, and there is IFRS 10, which talks about consolidated financial statements. So as a first, as a first protocol is the standard, which is IFRS 3, it defines a business as a structured and coordinated set of activities, which obtains inputs and processes them into outputs, thereby generating revenue and manage expenses profitably, you know? That's the definition of a business or a coordinated set of activities which, you know, have got inputs and there are processes in place to generate outputs. So by increasing or generating returns to investors, that's a business. 
you know, knowledge of whether this was a business combination or this was something else, it depends on whether whatever you acquired, it, it really met the definition of a business. Because if you acquire something and it doesn't meet the definition of a business, there are no inputs, out processes in place and outputs which can be sold profitably. If, they, if these aspects of the definition are not met, we don't say you have acquired a business, but we say you have acquired an asset. So business combinations, no wonder why it first starts by defining for us what a business is. So if you acquire a business, it depends on the levels of ownership that you have acquired. If you acquire less than 20% of voting shares in an entity, you can't say I have acquired a subsidiary. Say you acquire 10% of shares in, 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 a, in a company. You can't say that company is my subsidiary. Neither can you say that company is my associate. So if you acquire less than 20% of shares, of voting shares in a company, we just treat it as an investment in equities. It's a simple investment in equities, nothing much. And we account for it in, a, a, in accordance with IFRS 9 financial instruments. So it, 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 acquiring less than 20% of voting shares in a company, it's just simple investment in equity instruments. But if you acquire between 20 to 49% of voting shares in a company, like you acquire between 20 to 49% inclusive of voting shares in a company, under the circumstances, we say you don't have control, but you have got significant influence. Are you getting that? If you acquire between 20 to 49 percent inclusive of voting shares in a company, we don't necessarily say you control the company, but rather we say you now have significant influence in that company, meaning major decisions cannot be done without even you knowing about it, though you can't veto them, but your influence is now significant. So how do we account for that investee in which you have got 20 to 49%? We call that the investee becomes the associate. It is an associate company of the investor. And once, once you invest in an associate, it is equity accounted in accordance with IAS IAS 28 associates and joint ventures. We, 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 we don't consolidate an associate. In other words, you don't add revenue expenses and assets of the associate. No, you equit account the associate. But if you acquire at least 50% of voting shares in a company, once you have 50% of voting shares in a company, 50% or more, you can veto the decisions being made by that company. So in, in so doing, you can control the company. You get that? The company which you acquire at least 50% of voting shares becomes your subsidiary because you control it. How do we test whether there is control? We, there are various ways to test whether you control a subsidiary. If you have got a right to appoint majority of board members, it's a testament that you control. Or if what you get from that company is not fixed, if you are entitled to variable returns, from that perspective also we say, you do have control of the company. So once you have control of the company or you have invested in a subsidiary, the, you become the parent of that subsidiary and collectively you are now known as the group. No wonder why we say group financial statements. As soon as you have control, I, 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 I first three says the group must be treated as a single entity. What does that mean? When you are preparing financial statements for the parent and its subsidiary, you treat that as a single entity. In other words, you consolidate. You consolidate. 
That's where the issue is. So once you consolidate, then I free 10, uh, and even I free 3, then give us what we call consolidation guidelines. So pay attention as I go through consolidation guidelines one by one in 10. So there is what is called consideration transferred. Basically, this is the amount that is paid to acquire a controlling interest in a subsidiary. The amount that you pay to acquire your interest in the subsidiary is what is called consideration transferred. And there are various elements of consideration transferred. When you are paying for your interest in a subsidiary, there are a lot of ways you can do so. These are what I'm referring to as elements of consideration transferred. You can, you can, you can, you can effect immediate cash payment. This is normally common, where you negotiate and pay, like what Elon Musk did when he's buying Twitter. It's a matter of saying, he said, I'm buying Twitter at $54.20 per share. So that, and he said cash, so that's an immediate cash payment. Then there's fair value of parent shares issued in exchange. Fair value of parent shares issued in exchange. You know, this one now doesn't have cash flow impact, but you are exchanging shares. Let me illustrate to you how it works. I want, I want to illustrate to you how it works. Fair value of shares issued in exchange. Let's say there is company A here, which wants to acquire company B. Company A wants to acquire company B, and they, these, company, these companies have got equity shares of dollar each. Equity shares of dollar each. Equity shares of dollar each. Let's say these are in millions. Company A has got 200 million and company B has got 50 million. Now, uh, then there is exchange ratio. They want to acquire exchange ratio. Let's say they want to say one A share exchange ratio is one a share for every b for every two b share acquired is shares acquired one a share for every two b shares acquired that is the exchange ratio and then current market price current market price per share current market price per share now the current market price per share is like this share price of a is trading at ten dollars is trading at ten dollars sorry and share price for b is trading at two dollars fifty two dollars fifty like this and then uh, so you are now told that A acquired A acquired 80% of B A acquired 80% of B's shares. Oh, sorry, it's updating. A acquired 80% of B's uh, shares by means of share exchange. So A acquired 80% of these shares by means of share exchange. So what 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 actually does this statement mean? It means it means uh, a is saying to B, give up your two shares and we give you one share. That's the exchange ratio. If you are a, B, a shareholder in B, you are being told to give up your two shares in B so that you get one share in A. 
So effectively speaking, the shareholders of B will end up becoming shareholders of A. So A is acquired B by share of is by means of share exchange. So con consideration transferred. Consideration transferred. Consideration transferred, it will be like this. Uh, A is acquiring 80%, so it's 80% of B's shares, meaning of 50 million, by means of share exchange, which is one for every two. And because A is giving its shares, it's giving its shares at $10 each. Consideration transferred. That would be consideration transferred. So it's 0 0.8 multiply by 50 multiply by 1 over 2. That's the exchange ratio. Multiply by $10. That's the price. So consideration transfer. Oh, it, 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 it's kind of a coincidence. Let me say the share price of A is it's $15. So in this case, let me say multiply by 15. Multiply by 15 here. Multiply by 15. So consideration transferred, it's consideration transferred in this case, it's 300 million. So if I told how much did A pay, even though the, the, it was a share exchange, but A is giving its own shares, which are valued at $15 per share. So effectively speaking, A has paid $15 million, but in a non-cash consideration. Then accounting for consideration transferred in A's books, accounting for consideration transferred in A's books. So notice, A is given out its own shares. It, it is giving one share for every two. So effectively speaking, A is issuing new shares. So equity share capital for A, equity shares, equity share capital for A, it will be, notice, it will be 80% multiply by 50 million shares multiplied by one over two multiplied by dollar. Why multiplying by dollar? Because the shares are of dollar each. So the share, the, the power value of shares issued will come here. So the power value is 0 0.8 times 0 0.5 times one over two times dollar. Or not 0.5 here, but by 50 here. So even though we are saying A has paid 300 million, but the power value of shares issued in the exchange is just 20 million. So where where does the 280 goes? Because the market price is four is 15, power value is dollar. It means the 14 goes to share premium of A. So we call it other components of equity, other components, components of equity, which is share premium there, other components of equity, which is your share premium. So share premium becomes 80% multiplied by 50 million, multiply by 1 over 2, multiply by $14. Notice it's not 15, because 15 is the market price and the 14 is the premium. So you get 280. And if you add this up, that becomes how consideration transferred will be accounted for in A's books. The 300 there, this is its breakdown. 
the power value increases the equity shares of the acquirer and the premium goes to other components of equity as the share premium. Okay. Then continuing. So I was explaining the fair value of shares issued in exchange, and then there is fair value of contingent consideration. Now we need to understand that if the so what so if you are calculating consideration transferred in a share exchange, how much were you going to put here? You are going to put 300. 300. Remember, 300 is the consideration transferred. And how are you going to account for it in, in, in the acquirer's books like this? Another way of acquiring a company is by paying a contingent consideration. Now, a contingent consideration is not cash, but it's a conditional consideration. It's a consideration that we pay after satisfying a particular condition. After satisfying a particular condition. So, so let's say, let's say, let me come here. Let me say A, 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 we pay, we pay 20 million, I will pay 25 million if B, B profit, if B profit, if B profit uh, grow, grows by 20 uh, by 25 percent, A will pay 25 million. Let's say in three years, if this profit grow by 25% in three years, this is a contingent consideration. You may say, why say? Because there's this word, if. This word, if here means there's a condition which is set and a payment that you pay upon fulfillment of a condition. It's a contingent consideration. So the fair values of, of contingent consideration, contingent consideration at the end, at the end of second, second um, and third years where the fair values of contingent consideration at the end of second and third year was, it was now 20 million, 23 million, and, and 20 million, 20 million, 20 million, 20 million uh, uh, respectively. I just want, I have given you this, I suppose there's a statement from the examiner that A will also pay 25 million if B's profit grows by 25% in the next three years. Now, due to, due to continuing losses, due to continuing losses, A is now saying, look, let us review these payments at, in year two, it's now 23, and in year three, it's now 20 million. How will A account for this? So, consideration transferred. Consideration transferred. When you are calculating goodwill, the amount you put here, when you are calculating goodwill, which amount you put here is fair value of contingent consideration you put at acquisition you put acquisition consideration at acquisition was 25 so that's what you put 
This is the fair value when you are calculating goodwill. Now, subsequent measurement. Subsequent, subsequent uh, measurement, meaning in, in in subsequent years, what how would you be measuring? Because you can't be recalculating goodwill over and over again. So suppose you are now in year two, and the year you are now in year three. So let's say year one, year two, year three, year one year two and year three in year one you are not told whether at the end of year one there was a movement so in year one you don't put anything to profit or loss so profit or loss there's nothing to put there because you are not told that end of year one there was a decrease but end of year two you are being told that the contingent consideration was revised downwards to 23. So the two decrease is income in the profit or loss. Two is income. So this one is other income. It's actually other income. Because you are saying the amount we are going to pay is was reviewed downwards. In year three, again, the three million is other income. Other income. I think the amount we're going to pay was further reduced by three million to twenty million. Now, in the statement of financial position, statement of financial position. By by this, we are saying consolidated. In the statement of financial position, this figure here. You say none, you say liabilities. Under liability section, in end of year one, you are supposed to pay 25. End of year two, you are supposed to pay 23. And end of year three, you are supposed to pay 20. So are you not seeing that if there is subsequent changes in the fair value of contingent consideration? The change just goes to profit or loss. If, the, if it is an increase, it will be an expense here. Suppose it was an increase, it will be an expense because we are saying the amount you are going to pay is increased. So that one is an expense. The increase will be, will be the expense. But the fair value at the end of each year goes to profit or loss. There is no need for you to recalculate goodwill again if, if the fair value changes subsequently then present value of deferred consideration so you now know that there is contingent consideration and there is what is called deferred consideration a deferred consideration i mean a contingent consideration you set a condition but a deferred consideration you just fix a future date get it right Contingent consideration, you set a condition. Deferred consideration, you just pay at a future date. Get that. So suppose we are saying A, we pay $50 million, $50 million at the end of two years. Of two years cost of capital cost of capital is cost of capital is 12 percent suppose there's a statement here which is saying a acquires b but amongst the, the considerations a will pay 50 million at the end of two years and cost of capital is 12 percent how will you how will you treat this transaction in group financial statement? So, when you are determining con consideration transfer, consideration transferred, 
in a determining consideration transferred, it's easy. We are saying A will pay 50 million, but remember, we, when consideration transferred, you need to know its value today. So that will be the present value. So it will be PV, which is equal to 50 million, multiplied by 1,12 to the power minus 2, because it will be paid after two years. And if I close my bracket, I get the answer equals And so 1, 1, 2 to the power of minus 2. So when I'm calculating con consideration transferred today, I don't say I pay 50, I pay the present value, which is 39,86. This is the amount that I will consider is consideration transferred. It will be the present value. So now, a subsequent measurement. Subsequent measurement, meaning what do you do next after you've calculated contingent consideration? Remember, you pay 50, but its value today is 39,86. That's what you put. So it, it is going to increase from 39,86 to 50 by interest of 12%. So you say profit or loss, Profit or loss? Oh, so let's say year one first. Year one. You say profit or loss. Then you come up with finance cost. Finance cost at 12%. Because it's going to increase by 12% finance cost. 0.12 multiplied by this. So in year one, you are going to have finance cost of 4,78 million. So your liability at the end of year one becomes liability at the end of year one. This is now a statement of financial position. You put liability, liability 44. This is year one. And then you come to year two. Year two, profit or loss, finance cost, finance cost, finance cost at 12%. What we are doing is called unwinding the discount. Because if you get a present value and you are building it up to future value, we say you are unwinding the interest. So what you then have here is uh, year two, that's the li liability at the end of year two. Liability. This goes to statement of financial position. So are you not seeing, when you are calculating the consideration transferred, you use the present value. But when you are now preparing financial statements going forward, you need to unwind the discount because you are saying you shall pay it at 50. But this is how the 50 builds up. No wonder why here we are saying present value of deferred consideration. Now, there's also this which is called debt issued by the parent in exchange of shares acquired. You know, we, we can, we, in, in as much as we can acquire a subsidiary by exchanging shares, we can also acquire a subsidiary by exchanging shares with debt. What does that mean? We are shareholders of A. What we ask shareholders of B to do, we simply say, can you give up your shares there and come here and take our debentures? So we are issuing debentures in exchange of shares. So clearly speaking, we will acquire A by issuing them our debentures. So after the acquisition, our liabilities will increase with the debentures we have issued. Our liabilities will increase with this debt we have issued. The value of PPE transferred as part of contingent consideration. 
they, you may not pay money, money, money shares or bonds. There are instances where you may transfer property, plant and equipment as part of consideration transferred. It's possible to do that. Once you acquire a subsidiary and you transfer PPE, it, it's normal. Yeah, and you paid something with your property. It's, it's normal. So, so here in Africa, you know, here in Africa, without sounding masculine, you know, if you are marrying someone, you'll be charged the cash. You may be charged the cash or cows. You, you, you are, you are still. It's part of consideration transferred. You know that. So, suppose A is to transfer property. A transfer a property with a kern amount, kern amount of three million. It and a fair value and fair value of uh, seven million at the date of acquisition. At the date of acquisition, so we can have a situation where A is going to transfer property with a carrying amount of three million and a fair value of seven million at the date of acquisition. What would be the consideration transferred? So it's a matter of of like of, of doing like this. Consideration transferred. Consideration transferred. Consideration transferred in this case is seven million. You take property at fair value. But a is transferred the property with seven million. It is this property at a carrying amount of four million. So A must recognize profit or on disposal of four million. So A must then say profit or loss. Profit or loss. So you then say profit a credit a other income with profit on disposal profit on disposal of how much four million simple is that this is this is this is how you account for transit property which was part of consideration transferred now continuing so all these are the points that I'm mentioning. When a subsidiary is acquired by way of share exchange, the parent is share capital will increase by the par value of shares issued in exchange. Any excess of the fair value of the parent is shares over their par value is recognized as a share premium in other components of equity. In the same vein, Debt issued by the parent to finance acquisition will increase the parent's non-current liabilities. Deferred consideration is consideration payable at a specified future date, and a contingent consideration is payable upon fulfillment of a specified condition. So that was um, guideline number one. Guideline number two is on goodwill. So this is how you calculate goodwill. First, you say consideration transferred. I've given you how to find this figure from above. So you now know the elements of consideration transferred. And then you say add fair value of NCI. So you put fair value of NCI. NCI means non-controlling interest or part of the share capital of the subsidiary, which we did not acquire. So if we acquire 80%, NCI is 20%. Then you say less fair value of subsidiaries, net assets at acquisition. Remember, net assets, when you are finding net assets, you are simply saying equity and liabilities. You, you, you need to know that. You don't find net assets by adding assets, no. Accounting equation says assets equals equity 
class liabilities. That's what accounting equation says, equity plus liability. So it also says equity equals assets minus liabilities. So what name is given to this figure here, assets minus liabilities? The figure which we give here is called net assets. The name we give to this is called net assets. I wonder why whenever we are finding net assets of a business, we just go to the equity section because equity equals assets minus liabilities. And assets minus liabilities are conventionally referred to as net assets. You get it? They are conventionally referred to as net assets. So no wonder why here we are now saying share capital, retained earnings, other reserves. But pay attention to this. Uh, these are assets, these are net assets in the balance sheet or in the statement of financial position. So if you come to the statement of financial position of Atlantis, you will see equity saying 10 million, and you see reserves saying 8 million. So these are carrying amounts. Please take note of that. These are not fair values because you are taking these from the statement of financial position. So these are carrying amounts. But when you acquire us, when you acquire Atlantis resources, the laptop here that I'm using, this laptop I'm using, let's say this laptop in our books has a value of 20. This laptop has a value of $20. So in your right senses, there's no way I can sell this laptop to you for $20. No. When you are acquiring Atlantis, there's no way I will sell this laptop to you for $20. What I will do is I will undertake what is called fair value adjustment. So what I will simply do is look, my laptop is a carrying amount of 20, but it's fair value 32. So what it means is the 20 is included already in these net assets figures. So I then do what is called fair value adjustment. Fair value adjustment, I then just put 12 because the carrying amount is already included. You get that? So for consolidation purposes, you don't consider 20. For consolidation purposes, you are going to consider 32. So if it was a downward, suppose fair value adjustment, I said fair value was 15. Here you would put minus five. So I've reviewed the carrying amount downwards. Remember the 20 is already included in the carrying amounts here, but the fifth, to make it 15, I have to put minus five here. And for consolidation purposes, I'm now using 15, not 20. So let me say, suppose it is still, 32, it's not 15. What it means is, what it means is we do have these consolidation adjustments. Consolidation adjustments. Do we have these consolidation adjustments? Now, like, like this. Uh, PPE, consolidated PPE, consolidated, remember to increase that figure, it increases by, it increases by 12, less additional depreciation, additional depreciation, 12. So notice, 
we have increased our assets by 12. This 12 also needs to be depreciated. So your consolidated PPE will increase by 12 less that year's that push, that depreciation portion for that year on the 12. If it was negative, it would be 12 plus excess depreciation on the 12. So that's what I'm referring to here by favor adjustments. Now, after you've done this, you get goodwill. Now, uh, once you get goodwill, this goodwill is an intangible non-current asset in the consolidated statement of financial position, meaning it has got its separate line. It is called intangible non-current assets. Intangible non-current assets. And, and, and another thing is, once you come up with goodwill, you don't depreciate or amortize goodwill. Goodwill is not depreciated. Goodwill is not amortized. Goodwill is not even revalued. But at each and at each and every year end, you test the goodwill for impairment in accordance with IAS 36, which is a, which is a standard on impairment of assets. So we don't depreciate goodwill, neither do we revalue goodwill, but rather we test the goodwill for impairment at each reporting date. And if there's a decrease or impairment loss, you credit it to consolidate, you debit it to consolidated profit or loss as an expense and reduce goodwill by the impairment, the impaired amount. What if you may say, what if say if this good was negative? When this good figure comes out negative, it means you paid less than the assets. That's what it means. It means what you have here at the top is less than the assets you got. So clearly speaking, it's like you were given a discount of some sort. So a negative good is called a bargain purchase, meaning you bargained for lower price. It's called a bargain purchase and is treated as other income. It's like you were given a discount on what you got. So you treat it as other income in the consolidated profit or loss, not in other comprehensive income, but in the profit or loss. Mm -hmm. So you may say, say, can you really pause a little bit and tell us about the fair value adjustments? Suppose you acquire a company today, are you able to come up with the fair values for all assets on that date? You do notice Elon Musk is yet to pay for Twitter because he's saying he was duped or misled by directors of Twitter. Up to now, it's now more than two months, Elon Musk is still undertaking fair value analysis for the price he was charged. So it is not practical, it is really practical for the acquirer to know the fair value right on the same date of acquisition. So what then do you do? According to I-3, which is the standard on business combinations, it gives you a 12 month grace period to come up with your fair values, right? To, to, to better understand whether, whether the fair values were the true fair values at acquisition. So I3 says, if I've got fair value of this building today, I may calculate goodwill with today's fair value, but I have got 12 months to undertake due diligence, to, to study the assumptions, how reasonable were the assumptions used in coming up with the fair value. And if I come up with new information within the 12 month period, it is, it is known as a measurement period. This 12 month is called measurement period. So if I, if I come up with new information within 12 months from acquisition date, I can retrospectively adjust my goodwill estimate with the new fair values that I've unearthed. So what I'm saying is, I-3 sets up, sets out 
measurement period of 12 months from acquisition date. Within this period, the acquirer may evaluate the reasonability of the assumptions used in coming up with fair values. If any new information is unearthed during the measurement period, the acquirer can retrospectively adjust the goodwill estimated at acquisition. Get that? So this is what I'm, 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 I'm saying here. To say fair value adjustments are necessary if the acquirer believes that subsidiary is identifiable net assets are carried at amounts below or above their fair values. The fair values are determined in accordance with IFRS 3, which is a standard of fair value measurement. IFRS 13, sorry, a standard on fair value measurement. Now, this is the point I want. IFRS 3 sets a measurement period of 12 months from acquisition date. Within this period, the acquirer can assess the reasonability of the assumptions used in determining fair values at acquisition. If new information is obtained during this period, the amounts used in e to estimate good or above will be retrospectively adjusted by relevant journal entries affecting good you calculated at acquisition date. Right? Right. Now, you now understand that these are the, this is how we calculate goodwill. Now, continue still on goodwill. It would make a lot of sense if I tell you that there are two main methods of accounting for goodwill. I haven't said there are two main methods of calculating goodwill. Take note, I said the two main methods of accounting for goodwill. Calculation is the same, but accounting for it differs depending on which method the group chooses. Together? So two main methods are in use when you are accounting for good. The first one is called full good method and the other one is called partial good method. Now, when we are saying full good method, when, when, when we are saying full good method, we are simply saying both parent and NCIE is a share in good get that right full good method means good you are raising it acquisition is owned by both the parent and nci so if nci is a share in good it means if this good is subsequently impaired meaning if there is an impairment loss on this good the nci will also be a, the share of that loss because NCI is a share of goodwill, so consequently, if the goodwill is later impaired, NCI will also be at the share of that impairment loss. That's part, that's full goodwill method. And you may say, say, how do I know that the group is using full goodwill method? For you to understand which method is being used by the group, you need to read this statement. Normally, it will be given by the examiner. It's a statement which shows that the group uses full good method. So it's saying with this method, the group's policy would be to measure NCI at fair value at the date of acquisition. So whenever you see this statement, it means full good method, where NCI is measured at fair value at the date of acquisition. Now, there is there is partial goodwill method. Now, with partial goodwill method, you, as the name suggests, we are saying goodwill is owned by one part, meaning parent only. The goodwill is not owned by both parent and NCI, but only parent only. It's partially owned. Among the parties, one part owns it. That's what we mean. So, if we say partial good method means NCI is no share of goodwill, it means if this goodwill is subsequently impaired, NCI does not bear the share of impairment loss. It doesn't have to, because you can't you can't charge NCI with impairment loss if it doesn't have a share in goodwill. 
That's part of good method. So you may say, say, how do I know that this exam, the, method, the exam requires me to use partial good method? Look for this statement. Whenever this statement is there, it means partial good. No wonder why they're saying. With this method, the group's policy would be to measure NCI at its proportionate share of subsidiaries identifiable net assets. Oh, if I may show, let if 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 I might have a question paper with me. Let me see if I have a question paper where I can show you these two statements. Okay. Let me just look it up on on the ACCA global website if it's if it allows me to just search it up. You know, that's where you get all the papers. Okay, I just wanted to show, I just want to show you the partial and full good method so that you know that this exam, the examiner requires what and in this exam, the examiner requires what. I'm not going to read the full question, but I'm simply reading this too, which is saying, a calculation of good, as I said, groups are number one in every exam. No wonder why we have to do this question first, this to these topics first. They are saying a calculation of good arising on acquisition of Kalisan, measuring NCI at fair value. So if NCI is measured at fair value, that's full good method. Or proportionate share of net assets, that's partial good method. Then second is now saying a discussion and allocation of Carlison's impairment loss and why the impairment loss would differ depending on how NCI is measured. How allocation of impairment loss would differ depending on how NCI is measured. Your answer should indicate a calculation and explanation of how the impairment would impact on consolidated financial statements. 11 marks. So in total here, there, is, there are 14 marks about the statement that I have just said, but of course they have included the issue of impairments, which we are yet to do. But um, as part of your discussion, you are supposed to tell the examiner that if we are using proportionate share method, in other words, partial good method, I said you look for this statement which is saying, with this method, the group's policy would be to measure NCI at acquisition at its proportionate share of subsidiaries identifiable net assets. So when you see this proportionate share like this in the question, it means partial good method. So it basically means good is owned by one part, and if there is impairment, NCI will not have a share of impairment. That's what it basically means. All right, and then now you can say, say, tell me, with fair value method is easy. When I'm calculating good here, I will just put fair value of NCI here. What if the examiner is now saying NCI is measured at its proportionate share of net assets? How do I use find NCI? So what you simply do is, Suppose NCI is 20%. What you do is you must first calculate net assets when this figure, when this slot here is blank. First find net assets. And then NCI is proportionate share of net assets. So if it's 20%, just say 20% of net assets. You come and, and 
and and and and and capture it there. All right. So this is what I'm referring to here by saying this means that when calculating good, you first find net assets of the subsidiary and multiply by NCI percentage to get value of NCI at acquisition. So important. All right. And realize the profits in inventory. You 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 are familiar with this in your earlier studies. You know when you are doing SBR, it's it's, a, it's an escalation from what we have done in FR. If we are exempted, it's still no problem. It, the, you are exempted on the basis that what you are exempted on is what basically you were supposed to know. So when companies within the group sell goods to each other at a profit and these goods are still in inventory at reporting date it means the profit the profit element within these goods which are still within the group at reporting date that profit is yet to be realized it's called an unrealized profit and we have to eliminate it always know that the profit is is deducted from the books of the center so if you, if you want to debit retained earnings, you debit retained earnings of the sender because the sender is the one who still has profits in the books. And also the inventory of the receiver. So if retained earnings of the sender are debited with an realized profit and the inventory of the receiver are as well credited with the same amount because the profit is within the group. But if the goods are sold outside the group, suppose A sells to B and then B sells everything outside, it means there is no more unrealized profit because the goods are no longer within the group. It means the group has realized the profit. And when you are calculating unrealized profit, make sure you are still conversant with basic knowledge of markup and margin. You know how you calculate markup, how you calculate margin and so forth you know please okay so there you are continuing number uh, guideline number four consolidated retained earnings cool. you know to consolidate is to add this is simple to consolidate is to aggregate so we are teaching you how you add how you aggregate so when you are calculating consolidated retained earnings, you, you take balance at reporting date for both parent and subsidiary, and then you say less balance at acquisition. Why are you saying balance at acquisition is deducted? Because the profit which you found the subsidiary with when you acquired it doesn't belong to you. It belonged to former owners, so you have to subtract it. And then you say less depreciation on fair value adjustments. You now know. I said when you have fair value adjustment upwards, there will be depreciation on that. Less provision of for unrealized profit. And this is deducted from the retained earnings of the sender or seller. If, if parent sells, you deduct from parent. If subsidiary sells, you deduct from the subsidiary. Now, basically, what you get now is the post acquisition retained earnings of the subsidiary. If you own the subsidiary 100%, it means this whole figure here belongs to you. If you own it 100%. But in most instances, you, can, you may be owning it, say, 80%. So you take what is called group share, meaning percentage acquired multiplied by A. If you acquired 80%, you, took, you take your 80% and the 20% will go to NCI. And then bargain purchase, you now know, I say the negative goodwill is called bargain purchase and is treated as other income. It's actually positive here. Share of associates post acquisition and retained earnings. As I said, if you acquire an associate, you just take share of profit. You don't consolidate it. Then decrease or increase in fair value of contingent consideration I have alluded to this earlier. Remember I told you that 
if there's contingent consideration, if it increases or decreases, like it was 25, 23, 20, so it was decreasing, and these these are incomes. If it if they were increasing, that would be an expense. Interest on deferred consideration, you now understand when I was saying unwinding the discount. Impairment of associate and of goodwill. Now, if 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 there's an impairment of goodwill, what you put here, it the, the share you put here, especially for goodwill. It depends on whether the group uses full good method or partial good method. If the group uses full good method, you only put parent share of impairment. If the group uses partial good method, it means the NCI does not have a share in goodwill. So the full impairment loss will be deducted from this line. Dividends declared or paid by the parent, finance cost on bonds issued at acquisition, interest on any provisions recognized at acquisition this this is this list just it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a comprehensive list in an exam you won't expect the examiner to give you all the elements of consideration transferred rather some will be omitted now carrying a carrying value of nci at reporting date meaning Meaning, what 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 would be the the reported value of NCI? So you simply say value at acquisition. You put the figure. This is the same figure that you have in your good working, the value at acquisition. And then NCI will increase by here where we say the group share. If group share is twenty percent of the profits of the subsidiary, I mean, is 80% of the profits of the subsidiary, it means 20% of the same figure here will come to NCI. And if you pay dividends to NCI, you subtract. So if you are using goodwill, NCI will also have a share of impairment. So this will be the carrying amount of reporting debt. Now, suppose you have an associate. We said an associate is not consolidated, but rather equity accounted. So you need to understand what we mean by equity accounting. An associate is not consolidated, but it is equity accounted. What do we mean? This is what it means. It means the associate is initially recognized at cost. At each reporting date, the carrying amount is tested for impairment, meaning you test whether the associate is still as valuable as you, as you thought. And if you realize that there is impairment loss, you take it out. And if you receive dividends from the associate, you also take them out. And if, you, if an associate makes profits, you also increase your investment in the associate by your share of that profit. So if you pay, so it like, it's like you pay 20 million a year, you say cost of the associate. And if the associate then from the date you acquired your 20 million, if the associate made a profit, suppose you, you own 30%, you say add share of the associate is post acquisition reserves, which is 30% of the profit that the associate made. If the associate pays you dividend, you deduct dividends. And if the associate is impaired, you subtract also impairment from the associate. This one, NCI does not have a share on the impairment of the associate. Now, consolidated statement of profit or loss, aggregation guidelines. Aggregation guidelines. Oh, so you can see I personally typed these notes. That is the effort I put to what I do. And I want you also to do the same. I repeat what I said before now. I said to consolidate is to add. You are, you are, you are, you are considering the group as a single entity. So when you are saying profit for the group, we are saying profit for the parent and its subsidiaries. So this is how you aggregate, or this is how you add. If for present purposes, P stands for parent and S stands for subsidiary. 
So how you add if like revenue, you say parent plus subsidiary, less intra-group sales. Parent plus subsidiary, less intra-group sales. That's how you add. Intra-group sales we make within the group. Make sure you ex eliminate them. Cost of sales, you say parent, parent is cost of sales plus subsidiary is cost of sales less intra-group sales, meaning this is the same figure we have at the top, plus any unrealized profit, put it there. Gross profit, and notice for other income, you say other income of the parent plus other income of the subsidiary, plus bargain purchase, plus decrease in fair value of contingent consideration. It's now making a lot of sense. Other expenses, you simply say expenses of the parent plus expenses of the subsidiary, less any intra-group expenses, meaning expenses which are not being paid to outside parties. Finance cost, remember to add interest on deferred consideration and even interest issued, interest on debt issued at acquisition. Share of the profit of the associate, remember to take that share after tax. Income tax expense, a parent plus a subsidiary, then you get profit for the year. But please note that if a subsidiary is acquired during the current financial year, like, like you acquire a subsidiary on 1 July, so if you are given financial statements of the subsidiary, they will be for the whole year. But you acquire you acquired it on one January. So when you are saying the revenue, revenue of the parent, you take it in full. But the revenue of the subsidiary, because it was a subsidiary from one July, you time apportion it by six over twelve, provided the year end is state one December. If the year end is state September, it will be July, August, September. So it was a subsidiary for just three months. So whenever a subsidiary is acquired during the current financial year, it means its revenue and expense items are time apportioned. Everything here which belongs to the subsidiary will be time apportioned. Right. Consolidated statement of financial position, aggregation guidelines. You now understand this is the basics of groups. Property plant and equipment is like property for parent plus property for subsidiary plus fair value adjustment. You now understand this. Less any depreciation on that fair value adjustment. Goodwill. Goodwill is you take goodwill as we have alluded to. Please remember to take out impairment on that goodwill. Other intangible assets. Notice. When we say goodwill and then we say other intangible assets, these two lines here, they tell you that goodwill is not mixed with other intangible assets. Goodwill line is on its own. And then here there is like investments, e.g. investment in associate. That's where you put it here. Then current assets, make sure you take of the parent and the subsidiary uh, less unrealized profit because it's profit content in the inventory. Remember to take to add any inventory which is still in transit. Receivables, you take receivables of the parent plus receivables of subsidiary minus intergroup debts. In the exam, intergroup debts are normally referred to as current accounts. Bank in the like manner P plus S and any cash which is yet in transit. Liabilities. Equity and liabilities. On the equity section, you simply take P only, plus any par value of unrecorded shares issued in exchange. You now know that when a subsidiary is acquired by means of share exchange, it means the parent shares will increase with those shares issued in exchange. I've showed you earlier. So, if you are told that the parent is yet to record the acquisition or the parent is yet to record the consideration transferred, that statement would mean you have to go to the parent's equity shares and increase its power value with the power value of shares issued in exchange. 
In the like manner, you also need to adjust its other components of equity with the share premium, as I have alluded to earlier. Retained earnings, you calculate them as per the retained earnings working. Other components of equity, you take P plus share of S since acquisition plus premium on shares issued in exchange. NCI, just consider this as per NCI working. Non-current liabilities, remember to include loans issued at acquisition, provisions at acquisition, and even interest unwound thereon. What, what do we mean by saying interest unwound thereon? If you come to contingent consideration, for example, if you come to contingent consideration, you do notice that we recorded a present value and we added interest and the liability is 44 for the first year. Now, this issue of adding interest to present value is known as unwinding interest. And then in the year two, you add again interest for year two and the liability is now 50. That's interest unwound there on. That's what we are referring to here. Current liabilities always payables. Remember to take out intergroup debts. Other liabilities like deferred consideration plus interest unwound plus even fair value of contingent consideration. So basically, why are these coming under current liabilities? They are coming under current liabilities if they are to be paid within one year. If they are to be paid after one year in more than a year, you put them under non-current liabilities. An important thing to notice is the figure you put in the statement of financial position is the figure at reporting date. The figure at acquisition is used in good calculation. So at acquisition, we used 39, we used the present value. But reporting date is now end of the year after acquisition. So this becomes end of the year. No wonder why we say we use the figure at reporting date. Right? Then another discussion item there is complex groups. Remember, we are, we are about to wrap it up. It's now on page nine, out, page five out of nine. So I just want to go through this and then I, I, I sent you the, 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 the videos with illustrations. That's it. We will need to understand first what, what we mean by this uh, before you go to the platform. Otherwise, you have challenges. So you have this video. Don't think you, you are understanding everything as I am saying it. There is still room for you to replay the video. We shall upload this video tomorrow or perhaps tonight's evening, this evening. And then we, 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 you can play, replay it, replay it, and do other quest the questions that I will send so that on Monday it will be something else. Complex groups. So when we are saying complex groups, we don't necessarily mean groups are now complex. By complex groups, it does not equate to say groups are now complex, no. Complex groups means the group structure is changed. Suppose I acquire a sub A acquires B and B acquires C. So there are now three, two subsidiaries of A. Or A acquires B, and A acquires C. O A acquires B and B acquires an associate. So this now becomes a complex group. So complexity of the group is there's nothing to do with groups being academically complex. No. Complexity of the group refers to the group architecture or group structure. That's what we are referring to by complexity of the group. So the very basic consolidation guidelines that I've been saying just now, they apply to complex groups. Don't even think they are new, they simply apply. But when you have put two subsidiaries, you are now saying subsidiary one plus subsidiary two. Where you were calculating one good view, you are now calculating how many good view? Two good views. 
So this is the very comforting statement that I have typed here, that complexity of the group refers to the group architecture. However, ordinary consolidation guidelines discussed above apply. Ordinary consolidation guidelines discussed above apply. So let me show you what we are I'm referring to. This is not even a new topic. This is just wanted you to know. P acquires S and S acquires SS. So of the three companies, only P must produce consolidated financial statements. Only P must produce consolidated financial statements, not S. But here you are noticing S in itself is a subsidiary of SS. But P is the one which must consolidate S and it must also consolidate SS. So SS is called the sub-subsidiary of P, meaning it is indirectly owned or indirectly controlled through P, through S. So when P is consolidating S, it's a straightforward thing. When P is consolidating S like this, it's, it's, it's fairly straightforward. The danger now is when P is consolidating SS. Because you can't say P on the SS 60%. No. What on the SS 60% is S, not P. So what is P's share in SS? It's actually 80% of 60%. So P will take 80% of 60%, which is 48%. So P is effective interest, notice. P is effective interest in SS, it's 48%. And the NCI is 52%. NCI now is 52%. You can see now. So you may say, oh, say, how can NCI be 52%? Isn't it a controlling interest now? No. And remember, we, as long as we control SS, even though our effective interest is 48%, but we control it by virtue of S here. So when P is taking share of profit made by S, P does not take 60%, it takes 48% of the profit made by S. And where does 52% goes? 52% goes to NCI. But in S, it's a straightforward. In S, P owns 80% and NCI is 20%. But in SS, P owns 80% of 60%, which is 48. And NCI in SS is 52%. So let's say P is calculating goodwill in SS because P is the one which calculates goodwill in S. P is the one which calculates goodwill in SS. But P did not pay for SS. What paid for SS is S. So what would be P's consideration transferred in SS? This is what I have here. P's consideration transferred in SS is 80% of the amount paid by S. Because P owns 80% of S and S buys SS. So 80% of whatever S paid, that will be the amount which P will use when calculating goodwill in SS. Then the balance, that is 20% of the other amount will reduce NCI in S. We call such a balance an indirect interest adjustment. Indirect interest adjustment. You see these questions in the illustration videos that I'm going to send. Right. Then another complex group is like D shape. Here is a D shape Y. P acquired S and S acquired SS. So, and P also acquired SS, but just for 10%. P also acquired SS just for 10%. So when we are, when you are telling your neighbor, you say P is a direct investment in SS and an indirect investment through S. So 
when you are calculating consideration transfer, how much did P pay to acquire SS for the purpose of good recalculation? You simply say direct, meaning the amount we paid to acquire S this 10%, you put it there, and then you say indirect, which is 80% of the amount paid by S. That is 80% of the amount. So you say direct amount paid for the 10%, and then indirect, 80% of the amount paid by S to acquire SS, then the balance, meaning the 20%, will reduce NCI in S. It is again called indirect interest adjustment. Now, if you are if you are asked how much does P own SS, you don't say P owns SS 75%, no. It is S which owns 75%. So how much does P owns SS? It has got a direct interest of 10%, which is this, and an indirect interest of 80% times 75%, which is 60%. So in total, P owns SS by 10% plus 60%, which is 70%, and NCI in SS is 30%. That's all you need to know about complex groups. Uh, that's that's so I, I put my NBA. I said regardless of the group structure or arch architecture, we simply need a single working for good, a single working for retained earnings. But this time, remember, you now have two subsidiaries. So there's a single working for goodwill, a single working for retained earnings and a single working for M M A N N C I. By that I'm saying just add another columns or two columns in case of good to accommodate the other subsidiary. This is so, so important in the interest of speed. Right? Step acquisition of subsidiaries. What do we mean by step acquisition of subsidiaries? We are saying a situation where you are acquiring a subsidiary in stages. That's, that's what it means by step acquisition. You are acquiring a subsidiary in stages. Okay. Uh, sorry, just want to read myself of something here. Okay, step acquisition of subsidiaries. You know, as 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 with as with most acquisitions, like Elon Musk's, you know, Elon Musk is recently acquired um elon musk has recently acquired twitter but you notice he was at one point a nine a ten percent world nine percent to be precise and he increased the ownership stake from nine percent to hundred percent so in other words he acquired twitter in stages and when a subsidiary is acquired in stages we call that step acquisition. You at one point you are at 10%, then you want to increase from 10% to the next level and so forth. Such subsidiaries are being acquired in stages. So it is important that you only consolidate, you only consolidate from the date you obtain control. Please pay attention to this. You only consolidate from the date you obtain control, not from the date you acquire the 10%. So you can acquire from 10% to well over 50%. This is like what Elon Musk did. He was at 90%, 9% of Twitter and increased the stake to well over, uh, to well over, oh, sorry. Okay, he increased it to well over 
is uh, uh, actually 200 percent or you may have 40 percent meaning it was an associate and then you increase the associate to a subsidiary where you have control so the 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 the, the threshold here is if you ex if you uh crossed the 50 percent boundary line this one if you increase your interest to the extent of crossing the 50% boundary line, you 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 de-recognize what it was because it was an associate. So you de-recognize your associate and giving it a subsidiary. I, I will simplify this for you. So for now, let me let me go through the stages. Let's say it was an investment or an associate, and it has become a subsidiary. Because it has become a subsidiary, it means you have to calculate goodwill. So in other words, there is need for fair value remeasurement of previously held interest. Because when you are calculating goodwill, you need to find fair value. When the day, whenever you get control, you need to find fair value. And when you are calculating fair value, you know, the previously held interest is deemed to have been sold and reacquired at fair value. That is when calculating good. The previously held interest is deemed to have been sold and reacquired at fair value. I, I, I'm going to explain this shortly. So this is how you calculate good. Notice. You say good is calculated as consideration transferred at fair value of previously held interest where then fair value of NCI, and then you say less fair value of subsidiaries, net assets acquired at the date we obtained control, and then you get good. So it was an associate, and then it becomes a subsidiary like this. It was 40%, and you crossed the boundary line. Now, this analog is like this. Please allow me to explain it. And also ask questions if you if you have it if you have any question it was associate becomes a subsidiary associate becomes a subsidiary you know such a transaction is comparable to when an associate becomes a subsidiary it's 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 it's, it's like it's like uh, a swap and top transaction. It's like a swap and top transaction. Like a swap and top transaction. So let's say you've got a Toyota Corolla. Toyota Corolla. Toyota Corolla, this is what we are referring to as associate. It has got carrying amount in your books. Carrying amount is five, and it has got a fair value of nine. Carrying amount is five, it has a fair value of nine. And then you want to, to buy MS, MS, MSCDs, a Mac. This one, you want, you go to car sales, and car sales, they are telling you that the make is going for, uh, let's say it's 40,000. Now, tell me, Melvin, how much would you pay for the make in a swap and top transaction? How much would you pay for the make in such a swap and top transaction? So Melvin, are you there? Hmm? Who is here? Wada. Let me know. Oh, Evelyn, yes, you can go ahead, Evelyn. How much would you pay in a swap and talk transaction? Yeah. Uh, 40 minus 9. 
Right. So if we see you driving your Mercedes Benz. Sorry, yeah. sir. Uh, I think I missed your question there. Just quickly go into the bathroom. Sorry. Ah, OK, it's fine. Sorry, uh, but, uh, Melvin has managed to, to answer me on that. Now, my question was, you, you have an associate with you, which is your Toyota Corolla. It is a killing amount of $5 and a fair value of 9 and you want to buy a Mercedes-Benz in a swap and talk transaction. You go to a car sales and the Mercedes-Mec is, is going for 40. And then my question was, how much would you pay in a swap and talk transaction? And and and, and Evelina said you pay 31. So if we see you driving your Mac, this Mac here is the subsidiary. So we are saying it was an associate and it's now a subsidiary. If we see you driving your make and we say we ask you a simple question, what was consideration transferred? How much did you pay? That's what it means. You will simply say, look, I paid cash. I paid cash of 31. And then I then had the fair value of Corolla fair value of Corolla. Uh, this is what we are referring to as previously held interest. Previously held interest. Then you say fair value of Corolla was nine. So for the make, this is the makeup of my 40 million. And in your books, we then the Corolla, effectively speaking, is no longer in your books. So you have to deal cognize, deal cognize the associate, which is your Corolla. You have to deal cognize it because effectively it was sold. Because it was sold in a swap and top transaction. We have to deal cognize the Corolla. How do you deal cognize the Corolla? You say fair value nine. You go to a car sale and they are selling you that the Corolla is a fair value of nine. But in your books, it is a carrying amount of five. What do you do? You recognize profit on disposal, gain on deal cognition of the associate, gain on deal cog mission of the associate. So you have to, to yeah, there's a gain on deal cognition of the associate, which is four. I'm sure when I say the swap and top, I said it an associate was your Toyota Corolla. In your books, it is a carrying amount, and if you take it to the car sale, they will give you the fair value. The subsidiary now that we have is now the Mercedes-Benz, which is trading at foot. Now, if in a swap and top transaction, meaning from an associate to a subsidiary, that's a swap and top. If we are ask you, how much have you paid for the Benz? You say, I paid cash 31 and a Toyota Corolla 9. So, the, so in other words, the previously held interest is a remeasured at fair value. If you get to a car sale with your Corolla, they are not interested with the carrying amount of your Corolla. They are interested in fair value of your Corolla in a swap and top transaction. But effectively speaking, because you have done a swap and top transaction, it means the Corolla has been sold. So you, it's no longer in your books. So you have to deal, cognize it by comparing the fair value which the car sale said it is, less the carrying amount of it in your books. So you made a profit of four. This basically is what I'm referring to here. The analog helps you to understand here that it was an investment or an associate which has become a subsidiary. As long as you now have control, what we have to do is to have fair value remeasurement of the previously held interest. In other words, go to a car sale and find the fair value of your Corolla. And when you are calculating goodwill, we are saying the Corolla is effectively sold. So you are saying, how much have you paid? You say cash, I have paid cash so much. 
And my fair value of the Corolla, which is previously held interest, was so much. And then you put your fair value of LCI, just like this, and then you get goodwill or bargain purchase. Because the carrying amount of the Corolla, the, amount, the Corolla, you no longer have it. You have to calculate gain or loss on deal cognition of the associate. All you have to do is to say, the car sale guys gave me a fair value of how much? Of nine. What was the carrying amount of my Corolla? So much. So if I made a gain or loss at acquisition. Now, this is transaction where it was a subs an associate and it becomes a subsidiary. Now, in the statement of profit or loss, in the statement of profit or loss, you consolidate from the date you get control. Statement of profit or loss, you consolidate from the date it became a subsidiary. You don't consolidate from where it was an associate. No. So, if this transaction takes place, for example, if this transaction takes place in September and the year end is December, you time apportion the revenue and expenses of the subsidiary from September to December, where you gained control. But in the statement of financial position, you just consolidate. There's no need to time apportion. The reason being, the statement of financial position is as it. It's not for the year. It's as it. So if it is at the year end, just consolidate because it's now at that date, it's a subsidiary. Increase in previously held interest. You know? Oh, so 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 you, you understand you understand this increase the, 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 from a sub, from an associate to a subsidiary because you obtained control, so there was need to for fair value remeasurement of the previously held interest. What if, what if it was, it was an associate? I mean, what it was a subsidiary where you own ten percent, and it remained a subsidiary, but you increased it. Uh, you owned seventy percent of a subsidiary. It remained a subsidiary, but you increased it to eighty percent. So it was from seventy to eight. When it is from 70 to 8, it was still, it was a subsidiary and it is still a subsidiary. So there's no need to calculate good. Number one, there's no need to calculate good. So it's not like a swap and top because it, 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 the status is not changed. You were consolidating at 70, you are still consolidating at 8. What has changed is your group share. NCI at 70 was 30, NCI at 80 was, is now 20. So you need to adjust your group share. That's what, what is changed. In other words, you calculate what is called adjustment to parent is equity or an equity adjustment. That's what you simply calculate. You continue to consolidate profit or loss as usual. There's nothing special. You continue to consolidate statement of financial position as usual. There's nothing special, but when you are calculating share which is attributable to NCI, you have to recognize that for the portion of the year, NCI was 30%. Now if you have increased from 70 to 80, NCI is now at 20%. So if this transaction takes place in April, it means from January to April, share of NCI must be time apportioned by 3 over 12 and multiplied by 30%. From 1 April to December, share of NCI must be up, 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 multiplied by 9 over 12, and then you take 20%. That's all you need. And that is called adjustment to parent equity. NCI decreases. Assets of, assets of the parent increases. So we can check whether the parent is gained by comparing what NCI has lost against what the parent has gained. If you increase your ownership stake, listen, from 70 to 8, you are paying money. So you pay money to get assets which previously belonged to NCI. Get that? You pay money to get the assets, 10%, which previously belonged to NCI. So we compare how much you have paid against how much the NCI value has fallen. How much you have paid against how much the NCI's value is falling. 
So if you pay less than the four in value in NCI, you say you have gained. So you, you, you have a positive adjustment to your equity. You just increase your retained earnings by that. If you pay more than how much the NCI has lost, it means you have lost. So you have a negative adjustment to your equity. So basically, that's what I'm saying with this statement. It is called an adjustment to parentis equity. How you, do you calculate it? Simple. You compare what you have paid to get that additional percentage against decrease in NCI's net assets. In other words, you have to calculate NCI. You have to calculate NCI first. Like here, it is advisable to first obtain carrying amount of NCI at a transaction date in order to determine the decrease in NCI. So what you do is, you first calculate NCI at this date where you, the transaction of paying for additional 10% happened. So you find the NCI scaling amount, and then you multiply 10% of that amount to find how much NCI is falling. So you compare how much you paid vis-a-vis -vis how much NCI is falling. If, 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 if you were using full goodwill method, NCI is a share in goodwill, so this time it will also lose 10% of its goodwill. So you, you compare four in NCI against how much you paid. You then, if, if, if you paid less, you have gained. If you paid more, you have lost. So you increase your retained earnings or components of equity or decrease them. Last but not least, you know, last but not least, group disposals. Group disposals. You know, we, as a general rule, companies acquire each other to create value. You, we acquire to create value. When you see a statement is saying this company is being acquired, at the heart of it all is the acquirer is expecting value creation from the transaction. That's what the acquirer is expecting. Now, when we, re when we realize that, oh, we expected value creation, but unfortunately, it appears there's no value which is coming by. What we do is we dispose. You know, even, even marriage is, when, when, when couples realize that nothing is moving, you hear people saying they are, they are planning for a divorce. And if you, if, you, if you check the reason, they say, our marriage is now going nowhere. In other words, no one is, is, is nobody is no longer seeing value in the eyes of the other. We call it divorce in personal relationships. In companies, we, we call it disposals, but the, the analog is the same. Shareholders are now realizing that we are no longer finding any value from continued uh, acquisition or from continued uh, engagement with this investment in our portfolio. Now, the disposal can happen in two ways. You can dispose in full, meaning complete disposal, or you can do what is called partial disposal. You may dispose in a, a, a subsidiary and leave your investment as an associate. So you were consolidating up to the date of disposal. Thereafter, you are now equity accounting the associate. Or you can make a full disposal, meaning do away with everything you had in this particular company. In other words, you only consolidate up to the date you dispose. Thereafter, there's no more subsidiary, nothing. So you don't consolidate anything thereafter. But because your investment in a subsidiary was, any, was your asset, it means you need to calculate gain or loss on disposal. Because well, when you invest in shares, you have an asset there. So on the date you dispose, there's need for you to calculate whether you gained or you have lost, because you dispose it favorably. So we need to recognize how much was your investment there in. Remember, you need to know how much with your net assets you are disposing. Because we are disposing equity, you are disposing net assets of a subsidiary. So you need to know 
The net assets you have disposed at their fair value against the amount you received when you sold these net assets to, 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 to determine whether you've gained or you've lost. So this is exactly what I'm going to discuss about in this section. It is a, it is a section on group disposals. So you can dispose from a subsidiary to an associate, meaning from control to 40%. So up to this date, it was a subsidiary you consolidated. Thereafter, you equity account because it's no longer a subsidiary. It's now an associate. Then here, uh, like if you make uh, from subsidiary to insignificant, like 10% and stuff, uh, that one is now, these are now simple investments in equities. They are accounted for in accordance with IFRS 9, as I mentioned earlier. So you have lost control if you are now below 50% when you were once above 50%. We say you, there is a group disposal which has taken place. So what you then have to do is you calculate group gain or loss on disposal. Whether you have made a full disposal or it's now an associate, you have to calculate group gain or loss on disposal. So, but before I tell you how you calculate group gain or loss on disposal, I what has happened now is it's, it's not a swap and talk, it's a, it's, it's a decrease. You are coming from a Benz into a Corolla, so notice. If you had a Mercedes Benz, which is your subsidiary, make. If you make, which is your subsidiary, it's trading at $30. And then you come up with, you go with it to a castle, or you sell it at 30, but you tell them, look, I want a Corolla. I want a Corolla with a fair value of six. How much cash will the car sale guys give you? Talk to yourself. How much cash? Just unmute and talk to yourself. Your subsidiary is a fair value of 30, but you want a Corolla of six. The car sales will give you cash of how much? Uh, 24. Yes, they will give you cash of 24. So if we meet you along the way, now we meet you along the way. And we say, oh, you have sold your make your subsidiary. You say, yes, I have sold it for cash of 24. And I have my Corolla. We call this the remaining interest. Corolla, which is the remaining. You know, these are the reasons why you in law with Atlas. You, you won't get these explanations from me. You call this the remaining interest. I, I really understand how I should explain explain this to you because I know the language we use in this part of the world. If you if you have, if if you get this video from someone in the UK, they don't even climb down to this because they right away English is their first language, so they know it right away. But by delineating it like this, you can see. So you can now see we meet you along the way. You say I sold my bed. It, of course it is state, but I remained with something of six so this is exactly what is happening you say cash received 24 and fair value of remaining interest that is if there's any if it's a full disposal this line will be zero this line there where we are saying the remaining interest so because this is now a disposal it means goodwill you, you, it's, you, you, if you lose control, you lose goodwill as well. Because good, you, you gained it because you controlled. Now that you have lost control, you lose goodwill as well. And then you need to find the fair value of net assets at date of disposal. This is no longer date of acquisition. At disposal date. And then you also subtract NCI notice. Because what you have disposed is your subsidiary. NCI, remember, you didn't acquire it in the first place. Let me repeat. What you have, what you have disposed is your stake. 
NCIU did not acquire it in the first place. No wonder why it is called NCI. So if you had acquired 80%, your make here is your 80%. But these assets are for the 100% of the company. But you dispose your 80%. These assets are for the 100% of the company. So you need to take out NCI from these net assets to get your 80% so that you compare your income for 80% vis-a-vis assets which were also attributable to you having taken out those for NCI. And the answer you get is the group gain or loss on disposal. Now, this group gain or loss on disposal is the consolidated gain or loss on disposal. It is consolidated. You put it as other income. You don't put it in, in other comprehensive income, no, in other income. But after you've calculated group gain uh, or loss on disposal, it means it's no longer a subsidiary. So you consolidate P and L up to the date of disposal, then equity account will be associated thereafter. In the statement of financial position, do not consolidate because it's no longer a subsidiary. But you, because you still have an, uh, you still have a, a, an associate, you have to equity account it. Now, still on you, Melvin, you said here I, I get cash of 24 and Corolla of 6. Now, if we meet you along, uh, you, you really understand that for the Corolla, you did not pay cash, right? Can you answer me that? Uh, yes, that's correct, sir. So, but we still ask you, how much have you paid for the Corolla? What will you say? For the coral out, say I paid six. Yes, you would still say I paid six, even though you have, you have not paid the actual cash because it was embedded within the max value. So, so when you are equity accounting the associates from this date, the fair value of that remaining interest it will become the cost of the associate because you may say say I'm not finding where we have paid for this particular corolla. In your books, you won't get the, the, the bank transfer for the Corolla, but there is need for the cost. So the fair value of the Corolla is deemed to be the cost of the associate. Now, you realize that this is consolidated gain. This is like consolidated gain or loss on disposal, in meaning it is the one which goes to the consolidated financial statements. But whether, whether you, you lose interest in disposing but, or you gain interest either way, there is what is called gain or loss in the parent is separate financial statements. So this is consolidated gain, it goes to consolidated profit or loss, but there is what is called gain or loss in separate financial statements, meaning those financial statements which we, 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 we don't even consolidate this. We just need to know in parent is separate financial statements. It's easy, it's a matter of saying, how much did we get when we disposed and what was the cost or carrying value of the investment disposed. So if you disposed 60%, uh, you simply say, how much did I get on the 60%? If it's 4 million, you put 4 million. What was the carrying amount in my books of the 60%, not of everything, of the amount I've actually disposed? Then you take it out. So you have to calculate the, so uh, let me remark, let me just remark on something there. Let's say uh, you disposed, you had 80%, let's say you had 80% investment. You had paid 80% investment in a subsidiary at a cost, this is how much it costed you. It costed you as, as 50 million. And then you disposed, you choose to dispose 60% of that for, you dispose 60% of that for 70 million. For 70 million. Right, you dispose this for 70 million. 
So what is gain in parent is separate financial statement. Gain in parent is, meaning this is doesn't consolidate it, it's separate financial statement. Separate financial statements. So what would be the gain in the parent is separate financial statements? It's easy. I'm saying you say, Disposal proceeds. You got 70. Now, in the notes, I said you less carrying value of investment disposed. Disposed. So you, you dispose the CGST. So you say less carrying amount of. 60% disposed. Now, you don't say carrying amount of 60% is 50, because 50 is for 80% that you, 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 you invested. Now you dispose the 60. So carrying amount of 60, you say 60 over 80, multiply by, you time up, you apportion it by 50, which is equals to 60 over 80. Multiply by that. So it's 37,5. So the uh, gain or loss, so there was a gain or loss of 35,2. This is how we calculate it. I'm emphasizing because I say the year of the investment disposed and I put it in bold. Meaning this is how you find it, like what I've done here. So, um, Right, invest uh, disposals where control is retained. Let me repeat this because I have mentioned it earlier. Remember earlier I said you can increase your ownership from 70 to 80. And I said nothing fundamentally changes there because we haven't lost any control. But rather you need to calculate equity adjustment because you are saying you paid for additional 10 and NCI lost in its net assets by 10. So you compare how much you paid against the loss in NCI because you gained the loss from NCI, but you paid cash. What if now is the opposite? You had 90%, but you, you want to sell 30% and remain at 60. On the face of it, it is still a subsidiary because it is still a subsidiary. There's nothing special, in other words, there is no need to say, can I consolidate? Can no, you still consolidate because it is still a subsidiary. But the share for NCI and your share have changed. So NCI is increased from when you had 90, NCI was 10. When you are now have 60, NCI is 40. So NCI is increased by 30%. It's increased by 30% to 40. Your investment was lost by 30% to Sigist. So you need to, to have what is called equity adjustment. Why? What, how does it go? You check how much you received from selling your 30. How much you received from selling your 30. But remember, by selling your 30, you are transferring your net assets to NCI. So you compare the amount you received by selling your 30 against the increase in value of NCI in the net assets. So how do you go about it? You need to find the carrying amount of net assets of NCI on this date. First, you find the carrying amount of NCI on this date and you find that by increasing them by 30%, they have gained how much? So if NCI was 10%, if it, and it has increased by 30, you simply say, notice. Suppose NCI, NCI, uh, NCI before was 10%. And then you calculate the, you calculate their carrying amount here and you find it's 400. And then you increase this NCI, you increase NCI by 30%. So you need to, to, it's now 40%. So you you need to know what is the increase in NCI in net assets. Increase NCI 
in natural sense. In, in NCI in natural sense, it's a matter of saying proportion. When there were 10, there were 400. They've increased by 30. So you say 30 over 10 multiplied by 400. You don't say for 30 percent of 400, but it said because they were when they were 10, they were at 400. Now that they've increased by 30, they've increased by how much? By proportion, 30 over 10 multiplied by 400 equals. So you say equals 30 over 10 multiplied by 400. So NCI is increased by 1,200. So you, this is this is the figure you then use to calculate adjustment in equity. You say how much have you paid for your third against how much is NCI lost in its net assets? It has lost. Uh, I mean, how much NCI is increased in its net assets? It is increased by one thousand two hundred. So you compare to find adjustment to parenthesis equity. So no wonder why you have this analog. That's what I'm referring to. How much have you received vis-a-vis -vis increase in net in NCI in net assets? You now know what I mean. If, if the parent uses full goodwill method, NCI will also increase in goodwill. Right. Right. Yeah. So you notice, as you say, I skim my stuff. I skim my stuff. The reason why I skim, it was just two, two hours, 30 minutes sharp. Uh, we do scheme because we know you have the whole week to replay this video. You may say, say, why can't you just make this video lesson for one hour? Are you telling me that for the whole week you just you were you paid hundred dollars as as tuition fee for you to learn for the whole week a video of one hour? Is that so, Evelyn? Is that what you want? At all. Clearly, it can't be like that. So when we are having this lengthy discussion, we are acknowledging that we have got whole week. So you there is plenty of opportunities for you to replay these videos until it sinks. And because I'm the one explaining, you have my word for that. That's all you need. And 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 it works out. You know, there are quite a lot of students, some who have even passed this without even seeing me, by merely trying to search where my selected videos are. Not all videos are on YouTube, but they would ask, say, say, I can't, I, um, I, I watched one of your videos, I'm having challenges with this topic. If you can send me a link wherever you have explained this, and they are actually passing, and you are not immune, you actually have your tutor. That's 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 the best you can have then. Now we we were discussing group business combinations. There's what is called joint arrangements. That's that's the last page. As you can see, it's page nine out of nine. So we are done. The this what is called joint arrangements. So you and I, you and I can can form a joint arrangement. This is a new standard, but it's relevant here. It's IFRS. Joint arrangements. So you and I, we can enter into an arrangement. Uh, an arrangement can take two forms. There's what is called joint operation. Joint operation. And there is what is called joint venture. There's joint operation and there is a joint venture. So if you and I, we are in a joint venture or we are in a joint operation, what we then have to do is, uh, here, or in a joint venture, in a joint operation, sorry, we don't form, we don't form a separate legal entity. A separate legal entity. If we form, if we are, if we are in a joint operation, 
we don't even form a separate legal entity. But if we are in a joint venture, we we form a separate legal entity. That's what we do in a joint venture. We form a separate legal entity. In a joint operation, we don't. Then, in a joint venture, we retain ownership of the assets transferred. We retain, we retain ownership of assets. So if, if you contribute assets that we are using in this joint operation, you will retain ownership of those assets. And here, assets are owned by the joint, by the special purpose vehicle. Assets are owned by SPV or separate legal entity. The company which we, where we transfer the assets to becomes the owner of those assets. So you and I will lose ownership of those assets. Uh, here, we agree on share of profits, share of profits, profit or loss. In a joint venture, we have got equal rights, equal or 50% each. Percent each and joint control. So in a joint venture, uh, nobody can make a decision without consent of the other. There's a mutual consent. In a joint operation, you can make your decision provided I will get my share of profit that we have agreed. In a joint operation, individually liable, individually liable for deaths. The death operation, we are individually liable. In a joint venture, SPV is liable. The company that we form is liable, not us. So, accounting. Accounting, accounting, accounting uh, treatment of this joint arrangement. How do we account for this? If it's a joint operation, it's like we undertake what is called line by line accounting. Line by line accounting. What do we mean by line by line, line by line accounting? Meaning, when you are preparing your financial statement, when you say sales, you say your sales plus the share of your sales from the joint operation. Expenses, your expenses plus the share of expenses from the joint operation. Uh, assets, your assets plus the assets which are being used by the joint operation. Receivables, your receivables plus your share of receivables from the joint operation. This is called line by line accounting. You get that? Now, what, 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 how do you go about it now if it's, if it's a joint venture? A joint venture, we use what is called equity accounting. Equity accounting. What does it mean? We don't do line by line. All you simply do is you say, you say, cost of assets transferred, fair value of assets, fair value, slash, which is the cost of assets transferred to the joint venture. The cost of assets transferred to the joint venture, put XX. You then say, share of profit from the joint venture share of profit from the joint venture x x x and then a uh, impairment less any impairment less any share of impairment share of impairment if there was an impairment of the joint venture 
take it out like this. This is called equity accounting. Caring amount. So you get caring amount here. Caring amount. So there you are. That's how you account. So you don't even need, we don't even need to know how much was your share of sales from the joint venture. No, we just need equity accounting, meaning take your share of profit. That's equity accounting. All right. So what am I what am I saying? What, am, what, what going forward? Uh, going forward, we are going to we are going to Okay, so this is done. All right. What what is left now is the uh, application of this. So tomorrow, remind me, I'm, I'm, I'm going to upload this. I send it to you. And as soon as I send it to you, this, I'm now going to send you the video with illustrations. But don't forget, we are doing uh, in our in our platform, learning platform, we are doing um, we are doing uh, D1. We are doing D1. One D three and D four. So today, let me show you what is it that we have done in SBR today. We have done D one basic groups, D two changes in group structure like acquisitions and disposals. So we are done with D one and D two today. So next week we shall do D four, but for you to thoroughly grasp D1 and D2 today, you now have my video. So if you are now playing these lecture videos, uh, you read the course notes. It's a matter of coming to start material section. So you open start material, course notes, go straight to course notes on D1 and D2. And then after you have read course notes or with your course notes open, you then play all these videos. Remember, these are basic groups. We acknowledge that some of you, you did FR years back, or you were even ex 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 exempted. No wonder why we are saying confidently tackle an FR style qu group question, preparing for the key workings and adjustments. So it's a matter of, it's SP, FR, that's basics. Distinguish between joint operation and a joint venture and how to account for both. You now know this. So illustrations are given in these uh, lecture videos. So that's it. And then D3, that's where we are doing step acquisition adjustment to parent equity, where control is lost, where control is retained, like step acquisitions, disposal during the period, where control is retained, and adjustments to parent equity. Uh, all these make sure you play these videos now after you've gone through my video again all this becomes very easy like from a subsidiary to an associate this is an illustration disposals where control is lost uh, where control is retained all these adjustments to parents equity we now have this why do i always commend you to the platform because it is the primary vehicle for our lecture delivery and, and videos on the platform are not like this very long video, which covers everything for two hours, 30 minutes. Videos on the platform are section specific. So you can, you can, we minimize the risk of you disengaging. But before I commend you to the platform as your tutor, I must go through everything. And we can't be having specific videos on everything. It would be rather prudent we do it like this. So that suppose, you have now gone through the platform, but you now just want to know groups at a single glance. You can't play all those 36 platform videos or 24 platform videos. All you simply do is my say is a single video for this. So why can't I just again revisit that single video and get a grasp of what groups are all about? So cheers, guys. Enjoy the rest of your week. Remember to remind me tomorrow. Bye.